Okay, this is, a, as I said, a tag team presentation from myself and uh, Professor David Rival, who is sitting at the back there uh, quietly, uh, ready to throw a few hand grenades my way, no doubt. Um, so we're going to talk about sustainable energy in northern communities. And I think in, even while Warren spoke uh, eloquently about the, more, the broader issues uh, in northern communities across the country, um, I think David and I have more or less looked um, or focused on, on Ontario. So I apologize to our colleagues from Manitoba, but um, uh, okay. So before I begin, <coughs> I want to take this opportunity <coughs> to remind uh, you of uh, uh, the Thousand Islands Energy Research Forum, which is being held in Alexandria Bay, New York, October the 30th to the November 1st. We sent out, I think, to all of you uh, earlier an announcement about this particular meeting. And it has, is an excellent opportunity for students in particular to link uh, across uh, the border with uh, researchers in New York State that are focused on exactly the same problems that we are in. Um, they have the same uh, demographics in many ways, apart from New York City, but <laughs> uh, as we do. Um, and so it's a great opportunity to, to interact with researchers and students that are uh, uh, from these universities that have listed. It's a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, sort of Friday afternoon, uh, all day Saturday, Sunday morning. Uh, accommodation and meals are included for a r ridiculously low price of about 300 bucks for um, uh, U.S. I'm sorry um, for uh, for that. And I've spoken to uh, Mark, and he did say that there is some funding available for CIRA registered students. Okay. I noticed that I don't have anything from you from Ottawa, so I'm I'm. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't have anything, but uh, I have been in touch with people there that are doing it. So. Okay, okay. Anyway, so that's just as a, as a heads up, so we'll, we'll move uh, for uh, the, uh, the website um, is, um, is obviously available and so on. So what we're going to talk about is the biomass option for northern regions. <coughs> and I want to emphasize that biomass, uh, at least in terms of what I'm going to be talking about, David is going to be talking about wind and so on. Um, is that biomass is just very young fossil fuel, right? It, it's, it hasn't been around that long, um, but it has all the nice attributes that uh, comes with uh, processed uh, fuel um, that uh, we see um, uh, every day in our lives. Um, so as an overview, um, Warren presented um, a sort of a fluctuating uh, oil prices, and this is the crude oil prices from the New York uh, ex uh, Exchange, and you can see a bit, perhaps a little bit more clearly than what he showed, um, this change in, in prices uh, uh, after 2008, um, which obviously gave rise to reduced um, uh, emissions, and then of course this fluctuating increase uh, over uh, the 2014 region, and then of course we're now down in this region here and perhaps uh, even lower. This just came off uh, the, uh, that, that website, uh, and I pulled that off two or three days ago. <coughs> so we know that these fluctuating fuel prices are going to create an awful lot of uncertainty for alternative ways of, of economically trying to introduce um, uh, alternative uh, options for energy uh, production. In addition, and again coming back down to, to what uh, Warren also spoke about, is the, the remote communities. And on this slide, um, uh, the, this is the Enercan one, which I think Warren had probably uh, pulled his data from. And, and it gives you a little bit more uh, um, granularity, if you will, in terms of, the, of, of where these remote communities are located and some of the challenges that uh, they face geographically. Now, in the context of Ontario, one of the things that is being discussed is Warren showed this electricity grid, and what's happening now is the discussions in, in northwestern Ontario about putting in additional lines, which of course complicates the introduction of uh, alternate uh, renewable resources uh, for some of those communities. 
And I say complicates. It doesn't necessarily mean it's going to uh, misplace them, displace them. And then uh, uh, there's <coughs> the First Nation community perspective from this CanBio uh, report, which is uh, also uh, linked here as well. The key piece here that I want to stress is that if you're dealing with areas in and around Vancouver or in and around Toronto, uh, we've already seen issues associated with NIMBYism, right? We, when the provincial government decided they wanted to put a power plant in Oakville, there was an outrage. And of course, everybody says, we don't want it, we don't want it. <coughs> and of course, uh, I and you, for the rest of your lives, will be paying for that mistake. Um, so there's that sort of uh, NIMBYism component. But it's also addressed or linked in to the NIMTOism part. And that is not in my term of office. Right? So that's the political component, which is what Warren was speaking about. <coughs> So, as I said, there are lots of studies for renewable energy uh, for the North, as indicated here, and, um, uh, and, and so on. One of them that is rather interesting is, is this one. It's called Ensuring a Sustainable Future, Making Progress on Environment and Equity. And so here's this, this book that uh, came out uh, a couple of years ago. And um, what I've done is listed the constraints that some of these communities have to face, um, or we have to face, when we are looking at a particular community, or as Warren said, and I think this is really, really important, is that if you look at all of those communities, all the individual communities, then each of them can perhaps argue that I have an issue with one of these, or multiples of these, but you don't want 292 different solutions. You need, you need one, one solution. Uh, well, one preferable solution. So I'm not going to go through this list of, uh, in terms of detail of what's, what's there. Um, I did do um, a rather nasty thing, and that is on Google I could actually get uh, the verbiage around each of these. So I managed to cut and paste this, and um, I'll leave it with Mark so that he can make copies, individual copies, so that we're not doing anything on, uh, on copyright. Um, I can't find this book in the library at this point, so, but it, it, it is available. Um, and provides some of the detailed uh, reasons or rationale behind why these constraints are there and why they are important on an individual uh, uh, community basis. But as any community wishes to move away or move towards, shall we say, um, a renewable energy um, <coughs> Uh, in network, there are, are a large number of options that they have to consider. And Warren, again, hit upon this verbally, but I think uh, a picture is worth a thousand words. So we can talk about um, these multiple technologies that one could introduce um, d depending upon where you are in any particular community. And I use this as saying that there's no real silver bullet to be able to solve this problem. It's a silver buckshot. In other words, you need multiple technologies to, to address uh, renewable energy in, in the north. So we talk about wind, and Dave will talk about this um, uh, a little bit later, which is essentially from an engineering perspective is a, a lift and drag mechanism that needs to be optimized. There's the solar PV and the solar thermal component. Uh, and again, Warren uh, talked about this a little bit. I would probably argue the toss about um, how far north you can go with, uh, with PV, given uh, the, uh, I'm not disputing the fact that we're going to stop the world turning or something like that, but um, we have made some tremendous advances on the, on the solar PV um, uh, spectrum selectivity and so on, and we've done some of that here. Um, there's obviously the small-scale hydro uh, wave and tidal, and an example of this is down in here, which is uh, what's called marine current turbines, and this is, was in the Bay of Fundy. Uh, and so if you've got a tidal stream, uh, you can extract power uh, from there. Obviously, uh, the, the fuel cell idea, whether it be for local, that is in the, uh, in the home, uh, or a community uh, itself, or in transport. Geothermal. 
um, and again addressed. Conservation measures also addressed by Warren. And, um, but he asked, is there one more? And I said, yes, there is. But he didn't mention it, but I will. Remember coal fusion? It's still around. Um, whether or not it actually comes out as, quote, cold fusion. But um, Lockheed Martin in the States um, a couple of years ago said that they've cracked that particular problem. We're still waiting, but that's still an option that, that may, uh, may come to fruition in, um, in the next 50 years. And then, of course, um, we have the biomass option as well. So let's just look at biomass and try to give you a bit more detail on this. Um, so biomass is, is sort of indicated up here in the raw form over here and in sort of pelletized form down below. And the first thing we have to notice is that water, uh, wood is 45% water. Um, and to give you an idea of um, what we're talking about here is that one ton of dry biomass is the equivalent of three barrels of oil. All right. Now, I've indicated here that the farm gate prices are somewhere between $50 to $100. And on the right-hand side, three barrels of oil were $300. That was pre <laughs> where we are now, right? So this was uh, in the mid-2000. Uh, and of course, now with the price of oil going down to $27 a barrel, Goldman and Sachs, then of course now becomes a problem of economics, of, of, uh, of, uh, of biomass given the, um, uh, the cost of oil. So that is, that is the cost of uh, the oil at production. Think about the transportation costs oh. associated with I delivering that product to a remote area. I, I totally agree with you. That's, that's just basically just a raw snapshot of, of that, yes. So we've got one ton of uh, fresh biomass is about 17 kilojoules, gigajoules per, per dry ton. So the average home in, uh, in Canada, and I think these numbers jive with what Warren was saying, is about 77 gigajoules per year for heating. Um, <clears throat> and uh, just as a note, a barrel of oil equivalent is about 6.2 uh, gigajoules. Okay, so since that one. Then if you sort of convert, there are various ways of converting biomass. Uh, one is to use gasification, um, um, and then there's liquid uh, pyrolysis. Or, of course, we can keep it in energy form, um, n noting that the, the energy cost that's required to produce um, the gas or liquid uh, or to actually dry uh, fresh biomass uh, for, for subsequent use. And that drying is becoming more and more important, particularly uh, as we move um, uh, into um, some of the potential chemical reactions that, that can occur. Then there's the, the production of gas, which would be, uh, would be hydrogen, which can be used, we know, for fuel cells. And if obtained, same from anaerobic digestion, then we can upgrade it as a replacement for fossil, uh, for natural gas, uh, as needs be. And so one of the ideas was to take the natural gas pipeline that we have in Canada and you distribute across it uh, regions or, or locations where you would produce through um, uh, anaerobic digestion, CH4, you upgrade it, and then you introduce it into the pipelines, and therefore you keep more of the, uh, the, the original uh, gas uh, in the wells. Then, of course, is the, the liquid or bio-oil that can be used for transportation. Uh, a wonderful um, uh, example of this was uh, we had a meeting in northern Ontario a few years ago, and somebody from uh, New Brunswick was running a diesel car or van and he put great big plastic tanks in the back and he went to around to all the McDonald's and the uh, Burger King and got all the used oil and he used that to drive up to the meeting and then drive back. I just kept thinking to myself, what a wonderful smell if you're in the tailpipe of that guy, right? So, you know. so anyway, he did that. Um, so that's certainly doable as a sort of a first off. Then of course there's for gen sets for, for diesel, uh, as was also mentioned. And then, of course, it's the value-added products that are also important. And to me, with the diminution in the use of oil or for energy, for pure uh, electrical production or some other uh, form of energy, what you're really doing is you're saving it for what we need for higher-value products. 
And that to me is, 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 is one benefit of reduced uh, use of oil for these other ins uh, uh, purposes. And then, of course, the dry form can be used for combustion to uh, replace, uh, displace coal and, and other fossil fuels. So if we look at um, uh, wood pellet and or biomass sustainability, then we have a problem with transportation. So again, uh, Warren um, and, um, uh, and also Neil Scott sort of redressed some of this in terms of the sparsity. So if you just look at, at um, this graph here, this is the graph of eastern Ontario. And you can see, you know, this is where we are in general. And there's lots of road and, and other form of transportation infrastructure. Whereas in northern Ontario, you've really um, only got a couple of Trans-Canada uh, uh, lines and maybe one or two ways of getting between them. Uh, and then up in this region up in here, there's really nothing in terms of transportation uh, other than perhaps logging roads and so on. Another one is the, the rail transport. This is from CN. This is not the, the global one where you have multiple um, uh, uh, lines or, or companies. And of course, you see this wonderful uh, east-west in, in Canada, but the north-south is decidedly into the southeast of the U.S., which is where biomass grows much more readily than in uh, Ontario, particularly up or in northern Canada up in here. So when certain companies were thinking about <coughs> um, biomass uh, production facilities and so on in this region, they realized that they couldn't compete because it's, it's, it's cheaper to get the stuff directly from the U.S. So we have this trans-border communication problem that we've got to consider uh, as well. Um, typical uh, ways of, of taking biomass is to produce these uh, what we call white pellets and these white pellets uh, have a number of uh, mechanical issues they uh, also have low energy density they have a lot of dusting they have um, a lot of, of um, uh, problems with water you put them in water and they basically expand like this and so being able to transport them or to store them becomes an additional cost associated uh, with these. Um, so any um, facility that we want to uh, include uh, in northern regions using, let's say, pellets of this type also have to include the cost of storage and maintaining that storage facility as well. Now, I also talked about um, uh, the dust component here. And in fact, the dust component uh, gave rise to a really massive explosion in a, in a power plant in northern Ontario, which I'll deal with in a moment. Um, and of course, um, it could have been quite devastating. Fortunately, the 10 people that were in this region had just gone for coffee. Otherwise, they would no longer be with us. Now, this idea of dust explosions occurs all the time when you're processing uh, wood. And there are a number of instances in British Columbia uh, and elsewhere around the world where uh, uh, explosions can occur. Okay. Now, the, the, the key element here, if, at least in terms of electricity power production, is in these two particular uh, bullets. One of them is that these particular pellets uh, have a problem for, for storage because they absorb water. The handling because they will break up and uh, create dust and so on and so forth. But also, they, they are also not processed enough and as a result when you try to break them up into a dust which is what you want in a combustion chamber you want very intimate interaction between the fuel and the oxygen then these things still have an awful lot of glue or what we call lignin on the inside and everything gets bunged up um, <clears throat> so the other part um, is, is, uh, as I said is that hydroscopic nature that uh, we need to worry about because if they if they get wet, we end up with that kind of mess as well. So a key piece in northern Ontario that, that, uh, that, we've, that we worked on here uh, was in a place called Atacokan, um, which um, if you sort of think about it is just to the west of, of uh, Thunder Bay, not that far north, but, um, but far enough uh, to create some, some issues that needed to be faced by OPG. So this is the original plant uh, sitting here. 
um, and a zoom in of this area here, which is the coal handling facility, is now located here. This explosion that we were talking about um, occurred in this building here, which is sitting here. So um, the key piece for, for us when we were working with them was that the, young, the, 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 the policy had been put in place that there would be no more coal-fired power stations in Ontario by 2014. We met that by 2012. And um, so what happens to this particular coal-fired power station plus others? Well, the others have, convened, have been converted to gas, and this is the one that's being converted solely to biomass. Where did they get their biomass from originally? Well, they had it shipped in from British Columbia, from the mountain pine beetle uh, infected areas, and so on and so forth. Uh, and so there was an additional transportation cost associated with that. But then they realized that if they wanted to do this on a full-time basis, that they needed to um, figure out where they were going to get the biomass from in and around here. And if you look at it, they needed about 40,000 hectares or two, 400 square kilometers non-contiguous space to be able to feed that amount of biomass into, uh, into this region here or into this uh, facility. Now, they've apparently overcome this, but I don't know the details how, other than they have taken a former um, uh, wood processing plant that's in Atacocan and they've converted it to pelletization. So I'm still not quite sure how they, they're feeding the raw material in. So as I said, a local supplier has been there. But it required some substantial reconfiguring by, o, uh, by OPG. These silos that are here cost $200 million just to build. And these silos are like the silos that you would have on a farm, right? You, you put uh, silage and what have you in, in a farm. You have these big, tall things. And what you need to do is you've got to make sure that nothing funny happens. And by funny, um, I'm talking about spontaneous combustion, right? So you've got, um, um, if you get wet, then your biological activity increases, the local internal temperature increases, and as that temperature increases, increases, you reach the ignition point, and out of a sudden, as soon as you put oxygen in, poof, it just goes. Um, uh, so we have spontaneous combustion abatement problems, and you've got dust uh, explosion protocols that need to be put in place. Now, I've got in here, uh, this is uh, recent, this came on my, uh, on my computer uh, uh, yesterday, about storage solutions for residential and commercial pellet heating operations. So the marketplace is beginning to realize that these sorts of, uh, of uh, facilities are needed, and they're beginning to roll into um, um, uh, the commercial space for people to use. Now, that's on the assumption that you're going to be using pellets of the white variety. But in fact, there are alternatives. So the alternative is to modify these. So you start off with this sort of wood stuff, and you can, what we can do is we can what called torrefaction. And torrefaction is like when you take your coffee beans and you roast them, and you get nice tasting coffee depending upon how much you've roasted it. And so what you're doing here is doing a mild pyro uh, pyrolysis, and as a result, you're sort of removing some of the volatiles. So in a sense, you're kind of carbonizing uh, the, the, the material. As a result of that, the energy density um, is, uh, remains at about 90%, but the mass that you've got is about 70%. Right? because of the internal st uh, structure uh, uh, has been reduced a little bit. So you've reduced these unwanted volatiles. There was the, the stuff that comes off, which is condensable, is all of these neat things, which, of course, can be used. Right? So you're, you're taking this raw material, and you're producing a potential downstream product um, for, for future use. Um, the key piece here is that by doing this torrefaction, you create a hydrophobic material. So when we put those white pellets in water, they went out and made a porridge. You put these in water, they absorb water, but when you take them out, the water evaporates. They remain torrefied, but their contiguousness is compromised. 
So we have a problem, again, with, with, um, with water, uh, even with, with these types of, of pellet shapes, which, as I said, are in um, cylindrical form. So we've managed to make these uh, from torrified material. Uh, the first U U.S. commercial plant was in 2008, and the resounding consensus is that these pellet pellets are difficult to make without binders, and they continue to break and do whatever. The binder piece is important because if you're using this for large-scale replacement of coal or in other high energy intensity in industries, then that binder can foul. It can foul the equipment and so on. So you don't want something that doesn't have that. All right. Okay. All right. So a few years ago, we said, we're engineers. We can solve this. And so we came up with this pallet, which is spherical, just like a Malteser. Remember those? Do you eat those? Don't eat that, but, you know, about the same size. So uh, we've managed to um, uh, get the process down where uh, we're about 96% efficient in terms of, of energy. Uh, so what, we're, what we get out is 96% of what we put in. Um, there's no large-scale production of these uh, uh, pellets have been undertaken, uh, but we're doing a cost analysis at the moment, and we are also uh, almost complete, finally almost complete after a few years, of getting a continuous production mechanism. We could produce these things, but it would cost me $100 per, which is not very efficient. But now we're getting to the point where we think we can start chunking these things out. So um, there, there's a, an, interesting, uh, an interesting future. Now, the other part of, of this is the sustainable alternative sources for, for biomass. And one of them is something that we're dealing with. We're working with Lafarge cement just to the west of, of, uh, of Kingston on something called low-carbon fuels. And these low-carbon fuels are fuels that have ended their normal lifetime of use. So you take this table, those tables there, it's all processed wood of some form or another, and somebody upstairs decides, OK, it's time to revamp this. So what do you do with all of this? You don't want to just put it into a landfill. You've got energy in here that you can use. So the idea here is that low-carbon fuels are, um, are, are, are from material that has ended this normal lifetime. What we're using right now are railway ties, which contain creosote, asphalt roofing shingles, which contain bitumen, municipal solid waste, which is selective. Right? We don't just take anything. We have to be very careful about filtering and so on. Something called ragtails which are cardboard cutoffs, you know, so each one of these cardboard boxes that you get out, this one sitting here, for example, <laughs> you get little square pieces of this stuff and they can be used uh, as an energy source. Uh, Tim Horton coffee cups and so on. And they're great because these cups have a slight wax on the outside or on, on them, and so that's an addi additional energy source. But more importantly, as we went through this process, um, one of the biggest issues that we had was not the technology, but it was the interfacing with the community. And, and we're going to come back to that uh, a little bit later. But more importantly as well, in terms of policy, was that what we tried here had a direct impact on the policy in Ontario. And so the government, um, in consultation with a number of industries, um, most notably the cement and lime and, and steel industries, came up with this proposal where the, the, the waste idea, right? It's not a waste disposal site that we're dealing with here, all right? So sites exempt from waste disposal site ECA approval would not be subjected to the requirements of the Environmental Assessment Act. And that's a key piece of, of policy legislation that says to these companies, that you don't need to go to an MS, uh, to a municipal solid waste supplier to get your material. Um, you're okay as you go. Okay. So that's a, a, a potential um, uh, opportunity uh, moving farther north. Now, we have a number of questions for you on this piece, but before we get to those, I'm going to ask David to come up and speak to what we call the wind option for um, northern regions. Thank you. 
So as I said, I'll give these to, to Mark. All right. And um, so, all right. you all right? Okay. Okay. So uh, I've decided to go right through lunch, talk about an hour, hour and a half, and uh, see you f gradually faint in front of my eyes. No, I, I'm going to keep this very short. I think there's been, I haven't had the luxury of being here this morning, but it sounds like there's been a lot of discussion on wind already, and so I'm not going to tell you the obvious and repeat um, what you already know. Um, all I'm going to do, I think, is, uh, I, actually, what I'm going to do is a little bit different. I'm going to start out with a very holistic approach. A little bit about our view on it and that it's a bit skewed. We talk about it like it's a new technology and that we're, you know, suddenly taking advantage of it when in reality this thing, this has basically been around for I'll argue for, for millions of years. Um, and finally, I'll talk about how uh, on-grid technology for wind, which is developing at a rapid pace, particularly in Europe, um, is, gr is spreading like a disease across the world, a good disease in this case. But when we go up north and we're off the grid, it, it actually there's very new and different problems that arise that, in my mind, also lead to great opportunities and, and might inspire your thoughts, because I know many people here are working on topics related to wind. Okay, well, I guess all I'm going to tell you is what you would have seen with this video, which is a, a pity because I think this embodies something more than just sort of the day-to-day -day discussion of wind. Um, extraction of energy from a flow is, in essence, a very, it dates back to the beginning of life on Earth in that propulsion through a medium, whether it's water or air or any other liquid, um, involves momentum transfer. And so over many centuries, or really millennia, Animals such as this trout have evolved to deal with these unsteady flows. In fact, in this particular um, video, and I encourage you, just go, go to um, Lao Dao if, you, if you're really interested. What this trout is able to do in a stream of flow is extract the unsteady energy in the wake of an obstacle in such a manner that it actually um, recycles the energy and produces thrust. And when, what's really remarkable about this is that the trout is dead. So these experiments were done, they killed the trout, threw it back in the tank, and the trout inherently extracted energy and moved forward. So, so the, the natural world out there has developed incredible <coughs> sophisticated strategies to deal with flows and to extract energy in flows. And as humans, even though we've been doing our wind energy and hydro work for what, a few, few hundred years, arguably a couple millennia, um, we really do it at a very primitive level. And so my argument is that we, we have a lot, there's a lot more potential to grow in, in this direction. And per perhaps it's actually more appropriate for small technology of wind rather than large. So I, I was in Washington this summer and, and had a, an afternoon to check out the, um, the gallery on the mall. And I came across, coincidentally, on these two paintings that tell you a story of life uh, 400 uh, plus years ago. In fact, we're almost exactly around 400 years ago. And so, for instance, here on the right, you see this uh, happy community of uh, skaters on a frozen canal. Of course, climate change uh, didn't benefit them in that period. Um, and, and you'll see that they have a windmill sitting right there in their community. So the idea that using a smaller scale wind power at a community level, there were no grids back then of course, the, the thought of this being novel is of course absurd. This has been around for, for many years and arguably around the world people have been using wind as a form, a tool. So of course back then these mills were used to, to crush grain and do useful work. They weren't, weren't powering any light, light bulbs at that point. But it, regardless, this is, this is, we have to look at this not as some kind of new phenomenon, rather as something that we're going to return to now that we've realized we can't continue at the pace that we are in, in, this, in this era. And here's another lovely painting. Again, you can see they're, they're strategically locating the wind at a higher point to get more energy. So, so really, um, I would argue that, that we're kind of revisiting the same old story, but now uh, at a time of greater need. And then in the last hundred years, we've gone from empirical um, experience with how to build wind turbines to more of an of a analytical engineering approach. So about a hundred years ago, um, some, some very elegant theories drawing on basic fluid mechanics were developed to determine the maximum efficiency of some machine in a flow. And it looks like a modern wind turbine, but this could be anything. It could be a, in a river. It could be a... Uh, vertical axis wind turbine, whatever you like. 
And the, the theory says that you're able to extract 16 27 of the kinetic energy in the flow. You can't get everything out of it, no matter how hard you try. The more blades you put on this thing, the more the flow just goes around it. It's that simple. So we know there's a, in a theoretical sense, there's a limit to how much energy we can extract out of the flow, but we haven't really explored what this flow looks like and, and really the limitations in particular sites. And so um, before I get into talking about the, the north, I'll just tell you about what's happening here in the south when we're on the grid. And, and very, you know, as, as was spoken to earlier, the technology, this is something already, this is basically completely out of date, but I'm going to show it anyways. The prediction in, um, in cumulative, okay, green is cumulative install capacity. We're looking to about 2030 here. This is from the U.S. Department of Energy. You can see that this, this, is, this is incredible, right? We're going from sort of some reasonable levels today to a, to a society that is using an, an, a considerable amount of its energy directly from wind or wind-related technologies. And you'll see also in terms of implementation on a year-to-year -year basis, which are these blue bars, there is a prediction to continue on at a blistering pace for several decades. You could argue that oil, might ha oil prices might influence this to some extent, but then, of course, the pressure from policy is, is there too. Um, here in Ontario, the, the more recent um, long-term energy plans, and I assume this is not in indifferent to say what you would have in Manitoba, is to go from a portfolio mix that gets rid of coal, as we, we know is, is in existence, with small slivers of wind and solar, and for that my biomass as well, to, to a case later on where you have a bigger piece of the pie um, dealing with wind, say in 2030. In particular, though, you have to note that this pie is considerably bigger than the pie on the left. It hasn't been shown that way, but as someone had pointed out earlier, where demand for energy is going to go up also considerably. And that includes the fact that conservation will, will take part of that to some extent. Okay? So, so the growth in wind is enormous, but of course, this is again, how is this relevant to, to um, off-grid communities? Um, and I'm coming to that very quickly. The challenges that we face, this is Wolf Island, this is what you see when you look out here on Kingston. We, we, we face many challenges. One is, of course, how to site them properly. The flow is assumed to be uniform, but really it's anything but that. The further north you go, icing becomes a major problem, and, and I don't need to convince you of that for anyone who's lived in this climate before. Um, the siting, so everyone talks about, oh, we go up to the north and it's, uh, you know, tundra, it's perfect, no trees blocking the wind, it's great, but, but really that's not the case. If you, as soon as you have a rocky terrain, this is no longer a flat lake. So, so the idea that you have no trees makes the wind resource better is actually not a good strong argument at all. Um, so what the challenge is if you have a community in the north and suddenly they decide they want wind, they need experts to come up and spend possibly a year or two to determine where the strategic point would be to place that wind turbine. And that is an excessive or an extreme cost that, that has to be considered. Um, I would argue that just because you're in the north that you're going to be less concerned about environmental impact would be, would be a nonsensical argument. And noise pollution, and if you're not going to have the, the, the fortune of building a very long connection to your wind turbine 10 kilometers from your, your community, you're going to have to deal with the noise considerations on, on the spot. And that, that, that is a major problem, particularly for small winds, small wind turbines. And of course, involvement and, and operation would be just as much a problem in the north as it is in the south. So this is a plot that I think really tells a, an interesting story because on one hand, it shows you the development of wind on the grid over many decades to where we are moving today. So the, the wind turbines on Wolf Island, for some reference, for those who, who have been out there, they're around two megawatts. So they're th of this size. They're quite big. If you go there, tr you'll see th this is not nothing to sneeze at. So, so now you look at le sort of the direction it's taking on the grid. These things are becoming enormous. Why? Because power scales with area. The more area you can sweep out, the more power you can extract. And economies of, economies of scale are just as much uh, important here as they would be in any other power source. So people would say, well, I could just put a one million of these things around and I'll get about the same power as one of these. But the, the operation cost of one million tiny wind turbines is, of course, um, completely, uh, completely senseless. 
But one small community in the north will not have, say, the $10 million plus to install one of these things. It just doesn't work that way. So the challenge will be, as far as I see it, to find some happy medium between the two where the economies of scale are helping you, but you're not forced um, paying back um, the, the upfront costs over 20 years. Um, the other thing that's important about scaling that I've, I've stated up here is that the inertia of a blade is non-linear in when you go from a small turbine to a large wind turbine. In fact, the inertia of a blade goes roughly with the power of uh, radius uh, to the power of four. So what that means is that when you have a gust of wind hitting a little wind turbine, the intermittency in the wind on a second to second basis will destroy the power quality and your ability to generate smooth consistent power. However, if your blades are the size of the largest aircrafts known, known to, to, to us today, a little gust or even a big gust won't really be a problem because you have so much inertia you'll just plow through it. So when we go to, to looking at large wind installation, this is really not, not a major issue, but in a small community, using a small wind turbine in an even slightly gusty environment will not be an appropriate um, solution without coupling it to a, to a battery or some kind of other um, intelligent diesel system. Okay. And I think that's the, the thing I want to stress the most. I found this schematic of a very large wind diesel system um, installed in the Caribbean on, 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 on uh, Aruba, I think, one of these small islands in the south of the Caribbean. And so you have this sort of cartoon drawing of a small wind park, or actually not so small wind park. These are pretty big machines. And as you've seen in the last couple days, you'll have some kind of you know, regulation system connected to a, a diesel power plant. This could be as small as a tiny little diesel mo motor or it could be an enormous place. It could also have biomass, which is something to consider and discuss. And then you have possibly backup and, and battery systems to, to deal with intermittency. But at these scales, even if there's a little bit of a variability, you're hoping that this turbine will maybe compensate for this one and this one will compensate for that one. And the more you can spread out your turbines over a geographic space, the more you can benefit from intermittency. So if a gust happens over there, this one here might not be affected and vice versa. So on the grid, say here in Ontario, we don't have that problem so much because we have plenty of wind parks spread out over larger regions. But if you have one turbine at your one community and that one minute when you really need that power, you have uh, a sudden dip in power for even two seconds, that turbine will start slowing down very quickly what do you do? You install expensive battery technology, and well, then again it comes back to a, a business case. And so one graph that I, I found just recently to make this argument shows you time in seconds. So this is, a, this is a minute. And don't be distracted by all these extra curves. Let's just focus on, on this, um, this uh, fun little bouncy wind speed plot right here, okay? So this is usually the cut-in cut speed of a wind turbine where you start to turn the blades at around four. So initially you don't have enough wind to produce a power, let alone turn it. The wind picks up, goes after four, but this black solid line is the actual rotational speed in revolutions per minute. So it doesn't immediately generate power. You get up to the cut-in speed and it starts flipping around, the turbine can't make up its mind and it, it delays for about a minute before it decides to finally speed up and start doing something useful. And so this is the problem of small wind turbines. People assume you can take wind, large wind turbine technology that works at say five megawatt scales, scale it down to something appropriate for a small community, put it down, turn it on and expect smooth consistent power and, and that doesn't work that way. What I was speaking to about um, siting there are all kinds of really interesting technologies about how to determine where to put your wind turbines. Let's say this is some terrain near the community and you can spend literally a couple years profiling the, the, the region where you want to put one wind turbine at an enormous cost. And so I think that will become, as people look at this carefully, uh, a limiting factor. Simply because, as I've spoken to before, as soon as you have unsteady uh, wind profiles, whether it's a shear or yaw or turbulence, you also get very uh, challenging structural um, reactions of your blades and, and the, the, the transmission system of your, of your turbine also suffers then drastically because of that. I found some cute pictures of icing. I don't know if it shows up well in your mind. If, if you were ever about to take off on an airplane and you see this, I would basically break through the emergency and, and run out. So similarly, 
as soon as you have a, a, a accretion of, of ice on the leading edge of a blade, the performance drops. And I, I know that there's plenty of work being done to deal with these, but again, you have to ask the energy that goes in to operating a wind turbine in an environment, um, is it really worth the expense if on a week-to-week -week basis over a period of six to eight months, you're constantly dealing and stopping the turbine? So I think that's all I had to say um, for the sake of lunch, saving lunch. Um, here, I think, are the questions. Maybe you'd like to Whatever. discuss this. Um, I think these, the, there's, there's plenty to think about, and I think there's plenty, in my opinion, plenty to research and, and pursue going down the road, it, more than just from a policy and from a business point of view. Um, these questions, I think, represent plenty to mull over, maybe over lunch, or Andrew, you were suggesting even as a, this is not something that I think anyone here in this room will have a quick answer to. No, but I think, um, uh, you were saying earlier about a project and within the context of that broader projects you were somewhat in some ways addressing what we're, we're asking here. So it could be that one or two of these questions could be modified as you as you tweak um, expectations from, from the students. Um, but you also notice that, th that this is at a, a, a much higher level than, than let's say that list of constraints that I gave, gave out. And uh, those constraints are quite specific um, and of course um, potentially unique to a particular community. I certainly agree with Warren that you need a much broader based policy um, uh, moving forward. And in fact in some ways this would help, I think, um, direct a policy would you say? Warren, you know, it, it's, it's these, you know, the engineering component, as we've seen from, from what David has said, we know what's going on. We know what we need to do. What we can't get our heads wrapped around is the social uh, and the political uh, and, and uh, psychological issues that, uh, that surround this movement towards a renewable, sustainable energy future. That's the, that's the big constraint in my mind. Right. So that's what these are trying to get you to think about. Questions? Yeah. I have actually a question that might sound silly to experts like yourself who deal with all these things, but we deal in civil with static things, yeah, yeah. whereas you guys deal with, deal with moving things, though we might be soon yeah. with moving things. I mean, by definition, I guess mechanical implies that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Or I would argue that if, 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 it's, if it's moving for civil, it's broken and therefore it's wrong, right? <laughs> we hope not. Exactly. We keep speaking here about, uh, let me call it a uh, natural uh, uh, wind. How about man made wind? I have to explain. I have always been intrigued by the idea we have uh, lots of wind generated by moving things like trains and vehicles. Ah, yeah. So I have always, as many of us I'm sure, thought about what if I install like, a few little fans on my moving car? Well, the argument might be that, that the uh, drag it would create, the energy you'll get, you'll lose it. Probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, I find it difficult to believe that a few small fans on a massive heavy-duty train mm -hmm. uh, going at 100 miles per hour will slow the train. Uh, sure you teach, you're teaching thermal right now, no, so no, you yeah, it's no, done. No, <laughs> instead of trying to extract energy that way, what you want to do is to go back to the trout. And what you want to do is to minimize the energy expenditure in the first place. And that comes down to fluid mechanics and drag, which is essentially what the trout is all about. So how many of you, if you're driving down the 401, have seen, uh, again going back to what Warren said with the, uh, uh, with the Walmart idea, these big trucks and they've got these peculiar little boxes extending out the back end. Have you seen those? Mm -hmm. We invented them here 25, 30 years ago. And I just dropped it. But now it's becoming a commercial success. Why? Because you can drag, drop the, what's called the form drag by 20%. In other words, you've got, you're, you're moving the same distance with 20% less fuel. 
So that's what we need to do. It's, it's the drag reduction. In other words, you're expending energy to overcome this, the interface friction between the body of the vehicle and the air. So I'm sure it has been sort of, if you put a few fans for the moving train or something, is that being done? Or is that being no, because that fan, that fan is going to, going to remove uh, uh, energy from, um, uh, your, your blockage area has increased. So your cross-section layer has increased, so therefore the drag has increased, and therefore you've got to spend more fuel. So it, it doesn't make any sense. What people have tried, they, they, they have put wind turbines along highways so that the wakes of, of, of vehicle traffic can be recaptured. So, I mean, and that sort of speaks to a little bit what you're suggesting. No, no, so the truck, you have to think the truck is dragging fluid with it, and that fluid has some momentum. And that momentum, that residual momentum, then passes through a wind turbine. But if you look at the basics of, of energy capture, it, it scales with velocity cubed and area. So I think in the grand scheme, you're, we have to get really desperate to start putting uh, turbines along the 401 if at the same time we have ample energy blowing on any afternoon. But I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a curious thought. I think the real question is, how do remote communities uh, deal? That wouldn't really help a remote community anyways, as far as I know, um, unless they you know, you go out on your canoe and you have a, I've, I've always thought about this too. No, it's, it's an interesting thought, I like it. Or you train a lot of the local uh, wildlife to help you uh, uh, give up some of their energy for your own benefits, so. Yeah, uh, one here and one there, yeah. Um, okay, we're, talk we're talking about the remote area. So I want to give you a little story now. About 15 years ago, um, I did a study for one of Manitoba's communities, Shamatwa, that's off the grid. And um, at the time, it used to cost Manitoba Hydro a dollar fifty-seven per kilowatt hour uh, to for the community's electrical usage. Now in Manitoba, everybody pays the same seven cents per kilowatt hour. So it basically Manitoba Hydro was losing a dollar forty-five per kilowatt hour because they were subsidizing the community. So we did a study and we found that if they could install seven um, wind turbines, uh, they would repay uh, whatever the cost of subsidizing and all that. In seven years, they could pay off mm -hmm. the cost of the seven um, wind turbines. So we presented to Manitoba Hydro and they said, oh yes, okay, now, um, how do we get these wind turbines to Shamatua? There are no roads. It's all winter roads. Mm -hmm. How do you get these towers? Uh, now we have to build roads and we have to transport them. So the cost was out of the question. <coughs> so it's impossible. So these, were lar these are large scale winter turbines. So large, uh, to, to meet the needs of the community. Okay. Uh, I said, we said, okay, because of the transportation costs, now let's figure out how do we reduce the cost so they said, okay, f how do you figure it out? I said, we'll use composite material. So mm -hmm. I got a grant from Hydro and um, large grants from government, and we produced and we developed a composite wind turbine tower mm -hmm. that would cut the cost by something like at least 50%. Mm -hmm. And uh, we patented the technology. Then uh, Manitoba Hydro said, no, we're working with Hydro. So they had a group of people working with alternative energy so Manitoba Hydro um, got rid of this group. They built a wind turbine farm near Winnipeg as a showcase, and they now have, they don't want to hear about wind anymore. That's it, they finished with wind. And if anyone is talking to them about northern communities, no. So they went ahead, spent $25 million building a storage area for diesel mm -hmm. in these communities because they used to store these barrels outside. Kids would go break them and sniff the gas you, and waste a lot of the gas. So they built $25 million later, they built a storage area. And there are four such communities in Manitoba. Hydro doesn't want to hear about any wind anymore. That's it, finished. So we developed a technology which is now ready to be used and yet the policies, the governments don't want to take that advantage. Now, if you're talking about wind farms in areas within 600 kilometers from a main road, then whatever you talked about is fine. And uh, we even, 
told them that in, um, if you're using steel towers, steel towers are actually 20% of the total cost, but you have to build a farm, wind farm, of 25 wind turbines to level the cost associated with the transportation and erection and cost. 25, minimum 25 wind turbines. If you use composite power, you only need two wind turbines because of the savings and the cost of transportation and erection. Mm -hmm. And yet, we still have uh, steel towers being imported from China and India at a tremendous cost. And uh, the, the cost of uh, building a wind turbine farm nowadays is going up because of the land I issues. So it's becoming more and more difficult in, here in Canada. In Europe, no. In <coughs> Europe, the government says you have to produce 10% of your power. Well, Ontario power. actually has also yeah. a program. So unless the, the government comes up, yeah. up for, then unless the government supports it, Very no true. one is moving. Yeah. Yeah. One of the options that I had thought about when, I think it was when Warren was speaking, um, is the, the real problem when you do not have um, physical access, that is being on the land access to these remote communities. And some years ago, and I don't know what the status is right now, but there were one or two companies either in Europe or in the US, maybe in Canada as well, that were, were um, uh, looking at airships, going right. back to the old dirigible yeah. idea, because there, you're, you know, it's 24 seven, and they're quite capable of being able to move these things, and you don't need an ice road to be able to move it. No, uh, one of my colleagues, <coughs> who was actually two, two days ago, and as it happens, and CPC was interviewed on exactly the same topic, uh, okay. and, and he's heading <coughs> groups to have airships to deliver cargo. And they are. I mean, the U.S. is using those to deliver military equipment to remote areas. So okay. it's not new technology. No. And yet we have not pursued those technologies no. in Canada. And it's no. an excellent idea. Yeah. But I'm thinking now in terms of policy, influences yeah, yeah. on policy. Is the issue the fact that the technology is there, but, but there's no encouragement to use it? In other words, there's no policy in place the that, that is this? Government's regulations when it comes to transportation, transportation, uh, especially airships, for example. What are they afraid about? The Hindenburg again or yes. something? Or, okay. <laughs> okay. Exactly. Okay. okay. All right. Yeah, All right. Yeah, I, I okay. think, I, All right. I mean, this is a great discussion, et cetera, but we, just, so. Lunch. <laughs> Lunch is waiting for us, and we can continue some of the discussion over lunch. So, okay. uh, thanks once again. Okay, thanks, guys.